distinguished and you've got, uh, uh, you know, trailblazing achievements, I must say. But I just want to start with food because I know I've just uh, read about a few months ago your two, uh, you know, books on food, uh, The Indian Pantry, delightful book, uh, and then Rude Food, 2004. But I just wanted to start by uh, talking a little bit about food, you know, when we were growing up, people used to say that you have to eat to live, not live to eat. But both are equally true. And uh, I mean, I think food is the most important thing in our lives, one of the most, certainly. And if you look at other creatures other than us human beings, they spend a lot of time just foraging for food to stay alive. And food is completely tied up with their ability to reproduce also. When the food supply reduces, the population reduces. I'm saying all this because in the lockdown, we observed the monkeys on campus very closely. And we have the langurs on the one hand and the rhesus on the other. And I notice how they forage for food every day. And in a way, if you think about our careers and our other I mean, our education, everything we prepare for in life, our travel, migration, a lot of this is actually a slightly more refined search for food, you know. Uh, and the Upanishads say, of course, that food is Brahman. Food is the ultimate reality for the simple reason that all of us, you know, are uh, eaters and eaten at the same time. We eat, but we're also being eaten. You know, every moment we are... Uh, you know, losing bits of ourselves and, you know, closer to disintegrating and joining the elements. And our, our very decaying bodies are going to feed the organic material around us, as we know. So everything is food and everything is a cycle of eating and being eaten. And in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this, we are in the, you know, we have this pandemic, which is drastically changing our approach to food, because food is also linked up with uh, uh, with social conviviality. We want to sit together and eat. It's a huge business all over the world, so it's affecting people's livelihoods. And uh, uh, and the post-COVID world is something we still don't have a very clear idea of. We're still negotiating it because we don't know much about the pandemic, in fact. And food is, of course, tied up with... Uh, not just the industry, not just restaurants, not just chefs and cooking, but it's a very great skill. It's a great, great art, culinary art. You know, it's a fine art, as you know, because you've written about it. You're, you're you know, the founder of Easy Diner. You're a food critic of great repute. And uh, all over the world, we know that uh, India is one of the great food cultures of the world, along with China and Turkey. And it's like a crescent, you know, food would travel from China through India, go, go up to Turkey, and then come right back. By Turkey, also meant Greece, because they they'd conquered Greece at one time. So our food travels, you know, through this crescent. And uh, as you know, India has thousands of varieties of dishes for all palates and cuisine. So we celebrate food in India. Our gods are offered. Uh, you know, prasad, uh, you know, offerings, consecrated offerings, which we consume also, and so forth. So food is sacred to us. But other than that, food is also about love. You know, when our parents cook for us, mothers or fathers or our sisters or brothers, or we cook for our children, it's an act of love. It's an act of devotion. Uh, and the nourishment that food provides is nourishment not just for the body, you know, but for our spirit and for our mind and for our hearts. And of course, food is about power, you know. He or she who controls the kitchen wields a huge amount of power, uh, especially in joint families, you know. And there's a lot of politics around food, a lot of politics in the kitchen, and uh, and so on. So this is such a fascinating subject, and we couldn't have thought of anyone better than yourself, uh, V, to help us uh, tease our way through through the future of food, so to speak, you know, because we're all trying to grapple, wrap our minds around this post-COVID world. And just a couple of words about your stellar achievements. Uh, you were born in London. I won't mention the date because you look 
far, far younger, uh, but uh, educated uh, first at Mayo College, Judge Mayer, and then Mill High School in London, where you won an open scholarship to read politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford, uh, at Bracenose College. And then this is the great achievement at the age of 22, when, you know, people are barely, you know, thinking about what to do with their lives, you became the founding editor, or rather the youngest editor in the history of Indian journalism when you uh, took over Bombay magazine. I still remember the magazine. It was a great magazine, and it was actually the prototype of all city magazines, you know, because there was a Delhi magazine also later. And then you relaunched uh, Imprint, which the great R.V. Pandit used to uh, edit for many, many years. I, I remember reading all these magazines when I was growing up, you know, almost goggle-eyed, you know. And then at 30, you became the editor of Sunday Magazine, which is, you know, the number one magazine at that time in India uh, and became the largest selling English magazine in India. Then you became a consulting editor for Ananda Bajar Patrika. You became the executive editor for uh, Hindustan Times, where you started multi-edition HD, that was a pioneering thing. You switched to TV. You had very many popular TV shows. You anchored Question Time on Doordarshan. And uh, you had the roundtable on Doordarshan, CNN. And, and then you switched to Star, if I remember right. And uh, uh, actually, I mean, you've had shows on NDTV, you know, and uh, on all the major channels. Custom Made, I seem to remember. Custom Made was a show. Good Times, Custom Made. So uh, we are so honored to have you. You're one of the most recognized faces uh, on Indian uh, media and one of our most distinguished journalists. Over to you, Veer, and speak as long as you like. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that vastly flattering introduction. I'm not sure I deserve any of it. And I always fear when people introduce me in such extravagant terms that they're setting me up for a fall. So I hope I don't disappoint you too much. A uh, couple of things to begin with. First of all, of course, thank you so much for inviting me to this. But I want to make it clear that I'm a journalist. I'm not an academic. And I'm sure you've had really great professionals and great intellectuals talking to you. So I'm going to talk to you from a purely journalistic perspective. So please treat this session as light relief, one that slightly lowered the tone of your otherwise high quality series. Uh, you mentioned Vakandi, Vakandi Upanishads, you talked about the Indian tradition, and that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the evolution of Indian food through the centuries and to the extent that I have a thesis, my thesis is that Indian food, and you mentioned the crescent from Turkey to China, is that Indian food is really a synthesis of many international influences, not just influences that came into India, but influences that India shared with the world. When we talk about ancient India, we don't have that much to go by. We are dependent on two sets of sources, or well, three really. The first is our own textual sources. The other is textual sources abroad. And the third is archaeology. From what little we know of our own textual sources, and there are accounts of what was eaten, say, during the Maurya Kingdom, on the whole, Indians tended to be non-vegetarian. We tended to eat many different kinds of animals. We were not particularly vegetarian till much later, and that perhaps that's because of the influence of Jainism. That's one theory. Another theory is Buddhism, which I find hard to believe because the early Buddhists seem to have been non-vegetarians. But if you were to go back beyond what we consider recorded history and go to the Indus Valley civilization, which in many ways is the cradle of everything that came afterwards, and I'm not getting into this whole was it Aryan, was it not controversy? Let's just accept it was a civilization. We sometimes forget, because we tend to do ourselves down, that not only was it one of the world's most advanced urban civilizations at that time, it was also a civilization that had many, many contacts with the rest of the world. There was trade between what was then Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley. They found Indus Valley seals 
in what is modern day Iraq and the rest of the Middle East. And much of what we consider to be Middle Eastern, I suspect may well have come from the original Indus Valley. What we know of the Indus Valley civilization, and here we're depending on archeological surveys rather than anything else, is two factors that I think over thousands of years have remained consistent in Indian food. Archaeologists have found spices, which suggests that even then, Indian food used spices unlike food elsewhere. And they've also found, and this I find interesting, they found dal. Now you can argue about spices and whether spices were used in the rest of the world or not, but dal is a peculiarly Indian thing. And the fact that you should be able to find evidence of dal, dal 2,500 years ago, tells you something about how <clears throat> as much as Indian food changes in many ways, the roots remain the same, dal and spices. And that's been true for 5,000 years, 6,000 years, depending on what kind of dating you take for the Indus Valley. A couple of other things about the Indus Valley. It's almost an article of faith that tandoori cooking, which was a North Indian tradition, came from the Middle East. And indeed, you have things that are like our tandoor, they're not quite called tandils and whatever, all over Central Asia and the Middle East. Now, the theory has been for many years that these were brought to India in the medieval era from the Middle East and we learned them. It may be true. But archaeologists have found what seem to be traces of clay, clay, clay ovens in Mohenjo-daro and various other IVC sites. So could it be that the tandoor went from India to the Middle East? Could it be that we were doing tandoori cooking long before anybody else has heard of it? It's controversial, but it's worth exploring. The other interesting thing that I think is worth exploring is that all research now suggests, as we know, people in that era generally ate wild animals, that domestication of animals began in the Indus Valley. All the evidence now suggests that the wild fowl was domesticated for the first time in the Indus Valley, that it went from the Indus Valley to Central Asia and to the Middle East. So therefore, every time you eat a chicken, it's really something that our ancestors created, at least the chicken as we now know it, the domesticated chicken. So you could argue, and I admit that this is a stretch, that perhaps the oldest Indian dish is actually tandoori chicken, given that we had tandoors and we had chicken 5,000 years ago. We have very little to go on for the rest, but if you look at early ancient recipe books, and there aren't that many, you find many things that we don't think of ancient India in terms of food. One is you find recipes for taking strips of meat and grilling them over open fires. This is what we would call a kebab. Again, a kebab we think came from abroad. I'm sure it did, I don't dispute that. But to say that we had no such tradition in India is wrong. We did have a tradition. There are recipes for kebabs in third century, fourth century textbooks, which I think is, and recipe books, which I think is interesting. And that leaves the South. We haven't actually, in most of our recipe books, or even our food history books, we don't talk much about the South, but it's now clear we found amphoras which were used either for oil or wine for trade between South India and Rome. And they've been dated back to it, first, second century. We've also found, and this I find interesting, lots of evidence of trade between Kerala, the South, and the Middle East. What's significant for me in all of this is that that trade predates the birth of the prophet and the establishment of Islam. Connections between India and the Middle East may later have become religious or invasive or whatever in nature, but we had a link with that all the way from the South which had nothing to do with Islam and nothing to do with any kind of invasion. All of these links contribute in many ways, as we shall see, to the development of Indian food. Let me see if I've left anything out. Uh, no, I think we should also talk to this is the sort of ancient to stroke medieval period about the conquests made by South Indian kings in East Asia. There's obviously been some kind of transference of East Asian traditions and South India, and vice versa. How these work, we don't know, but 
let's look at some obvious examples. The thighs, for instance, use coconut milk curries, which are not dissimilar to coconut milk curries in much of South India. Did these traditions develop independently? Did we send it to them? We don't know. We do know that in the medieval period, Indian curries went to Thailand. One of the most popular curries in Thailand to this day is called a Masaman curry, which is a Thai corruption of the Indian word Musulman. It's very clearly an Indian curry made with potatoes, peas, meat, beef, with a little Musulman curry. And there's very little doubt that it came from India. There was, I think, also, did we create it ourselves? Was it created around the ninth century? One theory now is that the techniques of rice fermentation and batter fermentation came from Indonesia, from Southeast Asia. But I mean, I think we can say pretty clearly the idli is ours. We created it. We may have borrowed techniques from elsewhere. It is not, as Achaya says, a dish we stole from Southeast Asia. Uh, that takes us to the medieval period. Now, there's a t tendency now to talk of the medieval period as being the Mughals coming to India, invading India, setting up courts, creating dishes in their courts, that these dishes spread all over India. This is not just an oversimplification, it's wrong. As we've seen, connections between the Middle East and India predate not just the Mughals or the Delhi Sultanate or anybody, they predate Islam. There's always been travelers, traders, people coming between that region and India. Many of the dishes we regard as being Indian actually have their origins there. You find all over the Middle East with slightly different variations in the name, a dish called a sanbusat. It is pretty much a samosa. There seems very little doubt because there are no samosas in very ancient Indian books. There seems very little doubt that they brought this to India and that we turned into a samosa, turned it into a samosa. We're not unusual in that. The same dish the Arabs took and the Moors took to Spain. It became the empanada in Spain. They took it to Italy where it became the calzone, which is now treated as a kind of pizza. But ultimately the Spanish even took it to South America where the empanada is found. So that kind of dish traveled around the world. But I would argue, and you can accuse me of a certain amount of chauvinism when I, sorry, you can accuse me of a certain amount of chauvinism when I say this, but that uh, our samosa is actually, of all of these dishes, the most successful version. There is something about India whereby we absorbed influences culinary influences from all over the world. And we created dishes that have become more famous and more popular. The other obvious example is the jalebi, which you find in Turkey, you find in Persia, you find all over with names like Zilabia, variations on the word jalebi. They tend to be thicker, they tend to be squishier, they tend to be more filled with syrup and not quite as crisp as the Indian jalebi. And I would argue that the Indian talent has always been deep fried. And we took their recipe and we created a crisp deep fried version, which became the jalebi. There's been a lot of work done recently, may I digress slightly, on jalebi batter. The chef Gaganan, whose restaurant was rated as what the world's third best restaurant and Asia's best restaurant for many years, has been experimenting with jalebi batter to make savory dishes because his view has always been that indians treat that batter only as a way of making one kind of dessert in fact the genius of india is frying and our ability to take that batter the other thing that i think very clearly came in the medieval period and it came from the middle east was baking and maida if you look at ancient indian texts there's not much reference to baking except perhaps in the tandoor sense in the ivc most of our food was not made with maida, all of our food. It was made with grains, there were different grains, but it was never made with refined flour. And therefore we never had the pastry that the Middle East did. The Arabs or various people from Central Asia and the Middle East brought maida to India and they set up a baking tradition. It's that tradition that gave us local biscuits, 
It's that tradition that gave us the naan. And it's remained essentially an Islamic tradition even now in India because pav is more often eaten in Muslim areas than it is. I'll come to pav and why it's called pav a little later. Or bread is more often eaten in Muslim areas. Biscuits are more often made by Muslim bakeries. And even now, a large number of bakeries in India tend to have Islamic origin. It's a profession that's associated with the Muslim community. Views have now turned around. The general view is that whole wheat is a much healthier way of cooking than mela. But for whatever it was, it's something we got. We got kulfi. There's very little doubt about that. There's no Indian tradition of kulfi. Kulfi came probably with the Which brings us to the big one. Did they bring us biryani or did they not bring us biryani? There's been so much written about it that I hesitate to step in, but I think it's worth, worth digression on this. Most of you will know that we've had in India and South India particularly, there are recipes for many years of cooking meat and vegetables with rice in a single dish. Often, and I'm not familiar with South Indian languages, but Achaya and many other people have found words in South Indian languages that Polo, polo, that sounds a little bit like Palau. And there's been an attempt to peddle, I think, the theory that Palau is an Indian invention. I'm not sure that's true. I think the word Palau, Palau, you find it in Turkey, you find it in Persia. It seems to me that while we may have had an Indian tradition of cooking meat with rice, the Palau certainly came to us from Central Asia or the Middle East. What we had in India and what we still continue to have is another great rice dish that we never give enough credit to, and that's khichdi. There was a time when khichdi was cooked in nearly every Indian household, especially in North India, when armies went out to battle, soldiers would set up little fires and cook their own individual khichdis. Khichdi was so popular that the story goes, and this we rely on Mughal sources, that the Emperor Jahangir on a trip to Gujarat was fed a vegetarian khichdi, and he loved it so much that he got cooks from Gujarat to make khichdi, and khichdi was served at the Mughal court, and there were days when the emperor was vegetarian, and all he would have was Gujarati khichdi. So, Palau, I think, as much as we would like to claim it as our own or whatever, is not our own. It's a dish that came from somewhere in the Middle East, and it continues to exist in the Middle East. However, Biryani, I think, is our own. There are, I mean, there is, I think, more than enough proof that the conventional view that biryani came from the Middle East and that we adapted it is bogus. This view is based usually on linguistics. The word biringe, stuff like that. These are all Persian words, and we are told that because it has Persian words, it must have come from Iran. Now, there are two problems with it. The first is, that Farsi was the language of much of the local Mughal court. So a lot of Farsi was used in India. So to base things on linguistics there is a mistake. Secondly, if biryani was invented in Iran, find me biryani in Iran. There is no such thing as biryani anywhere in Iran. You find it in little bits of the Middle East. And where those places where you do find it, it came almost certainly from India. So who invented biryani? Again, we don't know. Some views are the Delhi Sultanate. Another view, and this is the conventional view, was that it was invented by the chefs in the Mughal court. Was it? Perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. But the earliest recorded recipes for biryani are in the Mughal court. How did biryani become a national dish? Why is it that anywhere you go in India, you'll find some variation of biryani. Now the official theory, and this is the theory you'll find in all food history books, is that the dish was invented in the Mughal court. It went from the Mughal court to Lucknow. So far, so good. It went from Awadh and from Delhi to Hyderabad when the Mughal sent the Nizamul Mulk to be their ambassador, their governor, and he took chefs. And that in each place it went to, it was adapted. In Awadh, it became about fragrance. 
when it went to Hyderabad, they took the spices of the Deccan, they added katash, sahanas, things like that to it. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with the view that says that everywhere where there is biryani, it was created by the Mughals and sent there. If you look at the biryanis of the Malabar coast, I find it very hard to believe that Shah Jahan sent a courier from Delhi and he was received in Calicut and they made it. They said, oh, wow, it's a recipe for biryani. Let's make it. In fact, I suspect, and this is again a supposition, the tradition of rice cooking and the tradition of rice cooking and meat has existed in the Malabar coast for much longer than the Mughals were around in India and probably before the Mughals knew very much about rice. My view has always been that the biryanis of Kerala evolved independently. They taste very different. They're made very differently. They use a very different kind of rice. They were in no way recipes from Delhi that were sent all the way south. As we've seen, there were connections between Kerala, the Kerala coast, sailors there, Yemen. A lot of people from the Middle East came and settled in Kerala. Many took local wives. There was a vibrant culture that continues, which is why Kerala is still, in many ways, the cradle of religions in India and has so many different religions. I suspect that that biryani, what we call a biryani, was their own. And that at some stage, they started using the term biryani for it. But this is a theory. Most books you read will tell you that biryani is an Iranian dish, biryani is an Iranian Farsi word, Indians just borrowed it, etc. I think that's bogus, but hey, what do I know? If you're going to stick with the Middle East, you have to remember that it didn't all come with the Mughals. The Mughals were not necessarily great gourmets, and they took things anyway out. When Humayu was in exile, he spent time in Iran. And the story in Iran, not just here, is that he introduced the Iranians <clears throat> to a peace pulao made with peas and basmati rice. And the Arabs are not keen on basmati rice, but Iran, there is now a basmati tradition only because Humayu went there and introduced them to it. So whatever fertilization or cross-fertilization there was, was not one way. I think it went both ways. When you come to the modern period, you talk rarely about Europeans and the influence they brought to India. And the sad reality is that Indians never really looked to, to European food. And there were no European ingredients of consequence that were introduced to India, which we loved. But what the Europeans did have going for them was the discovery of the new world. And they brought many things that they had discovered in the new world and introduced them to India. And when you think of all the things they brought and how quickly we adjusted to them, it's intriguing. The tomato, for instance, which in the 20th century spread all over India, is a new world vegetable. More significantly, the potato is a new world vegetable with we have no record of having had anything to do with potatoes before. So much of what we consider regional Indian cuisine dating back centuries cannot be any such thing because the ingredients came from the new world and were brought here by Europeans. Let me give you an example. If you ask any Punjabi about Rajma, if you ask about Makkeki Roti, he will tell you that these are in Punjabi dishes dating back centuries. They're not. Rajma, the kidney bean, was discovered in the new world. It was planted in the Punjab by the British and the North India. Corn, which, from which they make makkeki roti, is even more recent. It was planted in the 19th and 20th century. After that, they started making corn flour or some kind of dough from corn and making makkeki roti. I mean, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. In all the years when the Europeans had rajma to play with and they had corn to play with, they never invented anything quite as delicious as Rajma Chawal or as Makkeki Roti. I think it's in many ways a tribute to it. But it also shows us that these claims that this is Indian, this is foreign, are not necessarily accurate. Tea, which we all regard as being, is, as you know, 
something the British found in China, came and planted in India because they wanted an export market. And as we also probably know, the popularity of tea in India really dates to the 1940s or the 1950s when the tea board made a determined push to push tea all over India. Coffee dates back even earlier. It came from Arabia. It was planted in Kurd. They stole the coffee beans, the legend goes, and then spread all over South India. So that continues to me to show what India's cuisine is about. It's about ingredients coming from elsewhere and being turned into, I think, the best possible versions of themselves. Which brings us, of course, the big one, the chili. Now we know that the chili was brought by the Portuguese to India, at least to parts of India. We know this because the Portuguese, for instance, you go to Goa, you will find a peri peri masala. But if you go to say Nando's outlet, you will find a peri peri chicken because the Portuguese on their way to India planted the peri peri chili, which had come from America in Mozambique and Angola, which were their colonies, then came to India and planted it in Goa. And yes, so a lot of the chili that we know came with the Portuguese, later with the British. It was planted all over. We took to it in a way that nobody had expected. Indian food had always had spices. Indian food had always been thick, it had always been hot. But the hotness had come traditionally from black pepper, which was the great Indian spice. One of the things Columbus was allegedly looking for when he discovered America by mistake. But is the chili really something that was introduced to us from abroad, or is there an Indian tradition? Again, I digress. But the whole story of the chili has always seemed to me to be full of holes. If you go to China, as I'm sure many of you have, and you go, say, to the Sichuan province, you will find that they eat more chilies than anybody else, as many chilies as, say, other rides. Everything is just full of chili. Where did the Sichuanese get the chili from? We are told the Portuguese from traders. I can accept that to an extent, but if things come from traders, then they should be popular in the port cities. They shouldn't really reach the hinterland. And yet, in the port cities of China, there's no great love of chilies. Take the Thais. The Thais are great chili experts. Where did the Thais get the chili from? The version we have is that the Portuguese sent an embassy to Thailand, which is, you know, is one of the few Asian countries never to be colonized. And the Thais saw this chili and said, hey, this is wonderful. Let's make it the center of our cuisine. Now, this has always struck me as odd. There's a similar problem with Korea. The version is that the Koreans got the chili from the Japanese when they were colonized, which is possible, but it begs the obvious question. Why didn't the Japanese use the chili then? Why are there no chilies in Japanese cuisine? And there's our very own Indian example. Many of you know that the hottest chilies in the world come from Nagaland, and the Northeast, things like the ghost chili, the Bujuraka. If you go to the Northeast, you find that chilies grow wild that there is a great tradition of eating a lot of chilies with the food. Where did those chilies come from? Where did that tradition come from? These were areas that were cut off from the rest of India. It was difficult to get to. There were not very many roads. There were hills. The only people who seemed to have got there around the 19th and early 20th century, foreigners who could have given them chilies, tend to be missionaries and usually Protestant missionaries. Now, are we expected to believe that the missionaries arrived in Nagaland and places with a Bible in one hand and a chili in the other, and the people said, oh, great, let's adopt Christianity and chili eating? I mean, it strains credulity. Nobody has ever answered this question to my satisfaction. If you read books, and there are many books on how the wonderful Europeans took the chili around the world, you never see any explanations for this. The Koreans now are using genetic testing and they've discovered that the chilies used in Korea have a different DNA from the South American chili, which is the chili that was taken around the world. So all of this begs the obvious question, was there in fact an East Asian chili, which you had in Burma and Thailand, you had in the, East Asia, the Eastern parts of India, the Northeastern parts, did this chili grow wild? Did it have nothing to do with the European stroke American chili tradition? I don't know. Nobody's really interested in investigating this, except for now the Koreans, because they have money. Because on the whole, poorer countries don't have much time to worry about 
where the food came from, and they're happy to accept the Western version. And I think there's work that needs to be done in the gym, on the gym. Which brings us to today. I don't know if many of us realize this, but there's been a huge shift in Indian tastes and Indian attitudes to food. Of the basic taste, there is a taste called umami, which is the taste of soya, the taste of shiitake mushroom, the taste of chicken stock, the taste of parmesan cheese, the taste of concentrated tomato. It's a taste that the Japanese claim to have discovered. And after they discovered it, they packaged it and called it ajinomoto, which is an umami flavoring. And it's been resisted by the West for years. It was on par with sweet, sour, salty, bitter, etc. It's now been accepted that there is such a taste because they found umami receptors on our tongue, which give us the ability to taste umami things. Now, my theory is that umami has never been part of the Indian palate. Very few of our dishes taste of umami. We have nothing like concentrated parmesan. Chicken stock is not a great part of our tradition. We don't really eat that many shiitake mushrooms in most of India. And certainly soya sauce was unknown to us. Now, my theory for what it's worth is that the biggest development in Indian food since 1945 has been the Indian discovery of umami. Think about it. What are the most popular dishes to be invented in India in the second half of the 20th century? The first one I would imagine would be butter chicken, which spread through India like wildfire. Butter chicken is what? It's essentially a concentrated tomato flavor. It's packed with umami. The next big thing that happens is pasta and pizza. When Indians say we like Italian food, we like pizza, we like pasta. We don't particularly like real Italian food. What are pasta and pizza about? They're about tomato sauce and they're about cheese. Indians on the whole like tomato sauce pastas. We like tomato sauce and cheese on our pizzas. What comes next, or maybe even before? Indian Chinese food. What I mean, Indian Chinese food, as we know, is not Chinese Chinese food. It's a branch of Indian cuisine. But what are the principal constituents of Indian Chinese food? If you've ever seen a Thelawala cooking Chinese food with his wok, he has one bottle of tomato ketchup and he has one bottle of soya sauce next to him. The defining characteristic of everything from chicken Manchurian, which is the new butter chicken, to all other kinds of Indian Chinese food is soya sauce. What's become trendy now? What's considered the fancy food among young people, rich people, not so rich people? Sushi rolls. Now, these have nothing to do. The Japanese would probably throw up if you served them these sushi rolls because they're usually made with cooked ingredients. But why do they work in India? They work in India because before people eat them, we dunk them into soya sauce. Now, my argument and my theory is, as my own, it's been not tested on anyone or experimented on or proved, is that umami has suddenly become a big part of the Indian diet. It's a flavor we were unused to. And it's a flavor, therefore, that's not entered our homes. It's a flavor that we associate with going out. We go out for butter chicken. Nobody makes a tandoor at home. Nobody makes tandoori chicken and therefore butter chicken at home. We go out for Japanese. We go out for pizza. We go out for chicken Manchurian. So eating out for Indians has become essentially a search for umami. I could be right. I could be wrong. But that's my thesis. So has globalization changed us? Yes, people will tell you that globalization has changed us because McDonald's is popular and people go to McDonald's. Actually, the success of McDonald's in India is an argument against globalization because when McDonald's came to India, they tried to make a version of their hamburger with, uh, with either goat meat or lamb, depending, to which version, depending on which version you believe. But it was called the Maharaja Mac. It was a dismal failure. So McDonald's changed its menu for India, making things like aloo tiki burgers and chana burgers and creating dishes that suited India. And that's pretty much true of many of the pizza chains also. You will find more and more Indian flavors. I thought the ultimate compliment to India came 
when McDonald's did a chicken Manchurian burger, because that's the real Indian flavor. These are not dishes you'll find in a McDonald's anywhere else in the world. So globalization of tastes, which we talk a lot about, has generally failed in India. Kentucky Fried Chicken is not such a huge thing. What's worked in India is umami. And we've taken umami and we've made it our own. We've looked at Italian pastas or whatever, and we've increased the tomato content, made them like Chinese food, eliminated what the Chinese would consider authentic, and made our own kind of Chinese food with lots of soy sauce and lots of umami. It's not a development I've seen much written about, but it seems to me to be significant. So to paraphrase, Indian food has evolved over the years, over the centuries, but it's always evolved in interesting ways. It's been open to influences from all over the world, whether it's been Palau's or whether it's been chicken Manchurian. But in almost every case, we've taken what we've got from abroad and we've made it our own. And that, I think, is the greatness of Indian cuisine. It's open to all influences. But give it a little time, and everything we eat, everything we see, everything we get, it becomes Indian. Thank you. Thank you, Magal. I hope I didn't go on too long. I should unmute myself. No, that was perfect. I was really fascinated by your umami theory. I think that's really original, that that's what we really a crave for uh, in our eat out uh, yeah. uh, you yeah. know uh, choices i think that that was very interesting and i had not thought of it uh, you know i was thinking about the most popular indian dish in england which was supposed to be balti uh, you know uh, chicken balti masala or whatever and that's also probably the same craving for rumami which is yeah. probably yeah. you know not native to the english who you know, ate yeah. meat and potatoes right. uh, for right. ever so long till uh, they started conquering the world and then adapting. Uh, I thought uh, I thought that I, I should request you also to say a few words before we open it up about, you know, the future of eating after this pandemic, you know, impact on restaurants, impact on, you know, sitting and eating together, the conviviality part of it and uh, also the economic uh, impact, because I think uh, as Indians had more and more disposable income, we found statistics show that they, uh, you know, spent it first of all on eating out, which yeah. is a kind of luxury because nobody, I mean, with hus especially middle class, uh, you know, lower middle class, if both uh, husband and wife are working, then eating out becomes a kind of relief, you know, from domestic drudgery. And when you go abroad, you find, I mean, I've lived abroad. In certain parts of the world, people don't cook at home at all. Like in Singapore, there are food courts in practically every building. And uh, in Thailand and other places, street food is hygienic and very cheap. So that, uh, you know, buying ingredients, going out shopping, then making things uh, is almost a luxury that, uh, you know, couples reserve for weekends. And how is all of that impacted by the pandemic? I mean, perhaps you can, uh, since, I mean, even as a food critic, uh, I mean, out of business, is Easy Diner out of business? Things like that. Or uh, are there new challenges and we're going to adapt? Because I know that uh, Zomato's bottom line has actually increased. Uh, I mean, they've done better because they're good at delivery. So even if people are not eating out, uh, you know, people do maybe order in, you know? I don't know. I thought, you know, we'd like to hear from you about that. Thanks. Yeah, you have, I think I agree with nearly everything you said. We've had a tradition of going out because, as you say, research has shown us all over the world that when a middle class gets more disposable income, the money goes first on eating out, and then it's they have a little bit more on travel, often foreign travel, which is pretty much the pattern we've seen in India since the liberalization of 1991. What's happened now is that you can't travel because there are all kinds of problems. And you can't really eat out. Restaurants are open, but most people are so frightened about eating out that other than the five-star hotels, which are slowly recovering their mojo, 
at standalone restaurants, people are not confident if they, they're not confident that the guy in the kitchen used a mask. And there is this misconception that the coronavirus survives or thrives in food. In fact, the coronavirus is killed by cooking. There's no real way you can get corona from food. But you can get corona in a restaurant where people are nearby, where not enough physical distancing not has been followed. Not, there's not enough cleaning of surfaces. So less and less people are going to restaurants. This has had what, several consequences. One of them is that more people are cooking at home than ever before. They're not just cooking the normal food because they now have time on their hands. They now miss restaurant food. So unusual things have happened. I wrote about this, that in the city of Asharpur, which is not, I think, the Paris of India or anywhere, I did a talk at their literary conference and everyone who attended was, I mean, first of all, that the, the, there should be a flourishing literary society in Hushyarpur, I thought was very gratifying. But everybody there was cooking. They were all making sourdough bread and stuff that I would never, I don't make at home. So obviously people have now pushed themselves. They have access to YouTube. They have access to recipes. They're trying to do things that they've never done before. They didn't have the time. They weren't adventurous enough. So in many ways, the lockdown has made us more adventurous as cooks. And because of the equalizing factor of YouTube or whatever, it's not as though it's only people in fancy urban metros who can do this. Anybody who has access to YouTube can find a recipe for sourdough bread and cook it. So that's one gratifying aspect. The other gratifying aspect is that more and more people are sitting down as families to eat. It's, I find encouraging because one of the things that I worried about was that the whole convivality which you referred to of sitting down to eat with your family had been disappearing. That's back and I think that's a good thing. Though, of course, periodically people will take their plates and watch what's happened to Nia Chakravarti on television or whatever. But there's still, I think, a greater sense of convivality when it comes. The third thing that's happening is delivery. Because people get bored, because people don't always want to cook, don't always want to be experimental, people are ordering more food than before. Now, delivery is in many ways the enemy of the restaurant business. In India, we've always worked on the assumption that the restaurants will do delivery. But any restaurant has many, many expenses that are irrelevant in the case of delivery, from the rent it pays, from the decor, from the salaries to the waiters, from the air conditioning to the pipe music. So what we've seen is a growth in the last six months, what are called ghost stroke cloud kitchens. These are places, uh, usually not very good localities, often on the fourth floor, fifth floor. The largest kitchens where sections are divided, the Chinese, Indian, momos, whatever. And these guys turn out food that is often as good, if not better, than many standalone restaurants. They manage to do this at a fraction of the cost of a restaurant. In a restaurant in Delhi or Bombay, the food cost, the actual cost of making the food is about 20 to 25%. 80% is other things. For a cloud kitchen, they just have that 20%. Rent is very little, etc. So they can make food really at about 30% of the cost of a restaurant meal. So they can undercut restaurants and that's what they're doing. The great growth sector in this pandemic has been cloud kitchens. You don't necessarily realize it's a cloud kitchen because you order from something say called biryani by kilo or some interesting brand name and you think the food is very good. You don't realize how it's been made. You don't realize we made in cloud kitchen. And why should you, as long as the food is good, why should it matter to me? What will happen, I think, even, and it's already happening, even though restaurants are open, people are not going back. What will happen in the months ahead when presumably we'll have a vaccination, a vaccine and life will return more or less to normal is that restaurants will find the going tough. Restaurants that have upped the game, that have produced some really great experience or outstanding food will probably survive. But for the rest, I think the future is bleeding. Wow. Thank you for that. I was actually reminded of uh, something my wife, Gayatri, started. Mm -hmm. Maybe 
with, before it's like called Chef in a Box. It was a startup yeah. which uh, yeah. lost money and failed, but it's very close to what you're telling us today about cloud kitchens. It was, uh, you know, like a startup kit you ordered, like, you know, especially dishes you can't easily make at home, like say a pineapple souffle. Uh, all the ingredients are brought to your doorstep. The, uh, very simple instructions of how to make them. Anyhow, uh, I right. before your wife was ahead of her time. She should start that again. It will work. Oh, you're there, sweetheart. Okay, maybe I, you can also I, tell I us have, about experience. I have a question on that also. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. But before that, I I can't help talking about uh, the Indian pantry for just a moment. It's a wonderful book uh, which uh, starts with the troublesome tomato and then go on through uh, vegetables, fruit, meat, eggs and so forth, seafood, dairy. Uh, and it's, it's extremely, extremely readable. OK, I just want to refer to our, uh, uh, you know, uh, our uh, audience to one little tidbit from there. It's called Eggs Kejriwal. OK, I'll just read a, a little excerpt. How was Eggs Kejriwal born? And then he, he gives a little note underneath, uh, Veer does. Uh, does Arvind Kejriwal lay eggs? Now, isn't this a fantastic hook for you to read the whole chapter? Then he says, yes, I know it is a silly question, but you would be amazed by how many variations on that theme I've heard over the last few years. The question stems from the newfound popularity of a fairly old dish, eggs, Kejriwal. Now, you know, I'll just uh, um, fast forward. If you go to the Wellington Club in in, uh, in Bombay, Mumbai, that's where they invented uh, eggs Kejriwal. It's like uh, in the Indian version of eggs Benedict. I'm an egitarian, so I don't venture beyond eggs. But I was very curious myself to see that on the menu when I was invited there. Uh, you know, some common friends. And uh, I discovered that Mr. Kejriwal has nothing to do with Arvind Kejriwal, as, as Veer points out. It was an old merchant uh, in uh, in Mumbai. And they would sneak out, they're vegetarians, they would sneak out to the Willingdon to try eggs and other forbidden dishes. And that's how eggs uh, Benedict, uh, no, so, uh, eggs Kejriwal was born uh on a piece of pao now pao you mentioned of course comes from the portuguese yeah. uh when yeah. you see because the bo bo bombay mumbai was uh, you know uh, then given to the british by catherine de braganza as a dowry so uh, pao bhaji and all of these dishes and the pao there is of course portuguese but uh, now i'm going to throw this open uh to our fellows and our audience uh, please send your questions by chat uh, because I can't see you easily. And uh, since I don't see a question, uh, maybe can Gayatri, you can question? start. Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. I will. You can, show, will. you can show your face also, if you like. I, I won't. Can, I can see it, yeah. yeah. Okay, we can't, we can't see you. Oh, there you are. Okay, perfect, go ahead. Yeah. I will thank you so much for tuned into this to just understand so many new things about food. I have three points and, you know, two questions. First, talk about khichdi. And I'm very, and, you know, it's interesting. Every state has a form of khichdi. In Tamil Nadu, where I come from, Pongal, which is also a form of khichdi. Yeah. So it's interesting how every state, Kerala or the North Punjab, has a different form of khichdi. So I just thought that's very interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, second point, you mentioned Avadh and Mughal. Now, there's a, these in Mughal cuisine is always very interchangeably used. So I wanted some clarity on that. And uh, third was the future of, you know, uh, in COVID, I've also seen some of these uh, new startups come where they give recipe boxes, which I started in 2016, as Makran told you. And that didn't work. I start, did it for a year. But now in the lockdown, I've seen these, uh, these startups come back. And I've seen even places, big shots like Moria send you uh, you know, uh, pizza dough and the ingredients to make a pizza at home and other bigger restaurants as well to do this. So what is the future of that business? And also related to the cloud kitchen, you said that what, you know, we have a whole uh, in Gurgaon, especially the, the home kitchens, you know, you have these aunties and mothers and grandmothers really, you know, make the have these home kitchens, which may not be FSSAI certified. 
but that's a kind that also was a very growing trend that you order from this auntie's biryani or whatever or this uh, this woman's cakes you know so i wanted to know that, that future also in the post covid world so okay. these are some questions let's let's take them one by one the mughlai avati saying you're right is used interchangeably because the term mughlai is pretty much lost all meaning now quality is called its food mughlai is clearly sort of made up punjabi food so the original idea was that mughlai would refer to the food of delhi the dishes of the delhi sultanate to the dishes of the mughal kitchen the problem is nobody seems to have the recipes kareems for instance claims that the recipes come from the mughal kitchen and if they did then the mughal kitchen was a lot less sophisticated than we thought because the recipes compared to our are fairly simple and basic so is there any way in which you can get delhi food i know itc hotels opened a restaurant called the delhi pavilion and they did a whole range of delhi food for catering and banquets called the helvi and they found recipes which they say come from mogal cookbooks etc but that's very much a niche thing and a very expensive thing so the food of delhi frankly is very hard to find the food of avad which is what all chefs seem to aspire to these days has taken over the second one was about those ready to cook packet packs you know i think that's a growth area nearly everybody is doing it one of the things when we talk about the delivery boom which we don't actually explain is that often the food when it comes looks disgusting it's difficult to arrange it to make it look nice on plates bits of it leak some of it i mean it's not necessarily an appetizing thing whereas if you give somebody a kit they can make it themselves they can make it at home you mentioned pizzas we made one of those do it yourself pizzas at home day before yesterday ritu dalmia the yeah. chef at diva mm-hmm. does the best do it yourself pizza she sends a pizza base she sends shards of parma ham she sends the cheese you just have to put it into an oven i think that's pretty much the future nearly every chef i know is doing this now because people get tired of having to reheat some things and often you can't reheat them so it's better to just do things with the ingredients ready and finish them at home apart from anything else it at least gives you a sense of a vaguely home cooked meal even if a lot of it came from outside so i'm very sorry to learn that you started this so long ago the time is right now if you started it now it would be a huge huge success the last question you had i think was about home chefs and home cooks i discovered this about 2 months 3 months ago a number of home chefs and partly it was economics because though we try and not talk about it a lot of people who are in business have seen their businesses collapse a lot of people have lost jobs and a lot of wives and people at home who are very good cooks have said why can't we contribute to the family finances that's the sadder part of the story but the truth is that many of them make food that is much better than restaurant food so i do a column in the ap called root food and about 3 months ago i wrote that if anybody is a home chef and had a new product or something they wanted to sell they should dm me on instagram direct message me on instagram and every day i get about four chefs or five home chefs messaging me if it seems interesting i buy the food i don't let them sell it free because they're all budget operations i try the food and i've been writing about them and i wrote about somebody who was doing mathur food two weeks ago and that's really taken off i find that people want flavors that are home style that are not restaurant style and home chefs have a certain finesse that restaurant chefs don't if you go to one of these cloud kitchens yeah the food is fine but it's the same nepali guy who's making chinese food because of some racist assumption that because he's a nepali he'll know how to make chinese food the same pahadi guy would be making cuisines he has no experience of here yeah, these are people cooking with love using their old recipes using their skills and i i don't know how long it will sustain itself but i'm doing everything possible to encourage this sector because i find the real talent and the real recipes of india are not in restaurants they're in home kitchens 
So, you know, just to add two reasons why I found that the recipe kit box never worked, even in posh areas like Gurgaon and South Delhi, when I started, was A, that uh, they everybody has a, you know, cook and they want to order, in, you know, they're just ordering from out rather than make it at home. And secondly, you know, these dishes are always like wonderful. I do not make it every day, dal chawal sabzi. So, you know, so it was always once in a week, once in two weeks they used to order. So the, again, to break even was very difficult. Some of my, and the other operational delivery costs with the weather and all being in India, the logistics is in a mess with, when it comes to food. So some of the challenges I thought I'll just share. Of, but you know, you know this, it's changing. We don't have a cook at home. We do our own food. Mm -hmm. So we like these recipe things because it's often much easier. Mama Goto is doing mm -hmm. cooking sauces. Deepa yeah. is doing cooking sauces, not just for things. There's a restaurant in Delhi called Flax, which does, they make fresh pasta. They make the sauce. You can finish the pasta at home and add the sauce. And you get food that's very authentic and better than restaurant quality. I just wish home chefs haven't yet worked out how to do this. You were ahead of your time. If more home chefs these finished at home things, I think that's pretty much the future. I wouldn't necessarily go and order from a restaurant ever again. Thank you. Know, you. It, well, it made me think uh, while you were talking that uh, what people seek nowadays, especially you know those who are somewhat well-to-do, is a more authentic experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. across the board. I mean, we are tired of pre-packaged things, things which, you know, are modular and taste uh, almost in a standardized, uh, you know, fashion. Like when you travel across India, you have a dish called, you know, paneer mutter that is served from, you know, Kashmir to Kanyakumari and uh, from uh, maybe Dwarka to Imphal. And it tastes practically the same. And it's awful wherever you eat it, when you eat out, that is. And you go out and you, you know, you, you go to another part of India and you ask, where can I get the local food? And people look at you as if, you know, you've come from some other planet. And I think now with the home chefs and with internet and with the compulsions of COVID, maybe, uh, you know, this more authentic, uh, you know, uh, cuisine might actually take off. But uh, let me see, uh, anybody has other questions? Let me take, okay, Professor Raju, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I uh, listen to uh, many of the things that you're saying, I agree with them. But there are a few points I wanted to make. First of all, uh, long time back, sometime in the 80s, I went to, I mean, in England, I was playing chess in somebody's house. He ran a McDonald's uh, firm. And he said the most popular item is masala dosa in Britain. <laughs> McDonald's. So it may not have worked uh, here, but apparently there they took this and it seemed to have worked. Although the stuff they make in Britain, it's awfully, I mean, absolutely inedible. The samosas and stuff like that. It's only the uh, Bangladeshi cooks and the Pakistani cooks and Indian cooks who are okay. But uh, what I was thinking was that, uh, for example, you talked about chili. Now, the chili is a very interesting thing. First of all, if you look at, um, yeah, even Cusco has an Indian restaurant. But if you look at uh, the uh, sort of uh, research that they did on crops, they had uh, nurseries and they did extensive research. That is something astonishing. That's number one. And number two, as you said, well, chili might have grown here. You see, there were always connections. And why do we think that uh, before Europeans, there were no connections? Right. You find the Indian elephant among the Maya. You find, if you look at the Maya flute, is uh, very similar to the Indian flute. It has five holes. You look at their poses. They are very similar. And there's so many things which are common. So uh, the pyramids, for example, which go from Egypt because of the connection from here to Egypt and from Egypt to Central America. Why should they both be making pyramids for so many thousands of years? So I think that uh, there may have been multiple connections. I mean, yeah, starting with the wrong belief, if we think that there was no connection before Columbus, Columbus didn't make a discovery. That's just a superstition. So there were so many people there. It's like saying Vasco da Gama discovered India. You know, we were very much around. We were not discovered by him. 
So I think that there could have been multiple connections, especially in the matter of Chidi, which uh, could have existed, but I'm unable to find texts which uh, point to the existence of, uh, to the use of Chidi uh, before uh, the Portuguese, or the use of batata, or the use of tomato, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that some research needs to be done, and why has Can you hear me, Sunay Dira? Yeah, you, you, I can, you can hear you. So that's uh, the second thing. And the third thing is that uh, you didn't mention this, uh, uh, you know, the Indian Can food from a century ago. Yeah. So uh, when I went to South Africa, mm -hmm. somebody said, oh, yeah, you would like to have home cooked food. So she brought me patta puri. <laughs> what was patta puri? I never heard of it. It was uh, basically yam and so on. And then somebody took me to this place where um, uh, Gandhiji was thrown out. And there I had something called Bani Chow. It's yes. the Banyas Chow. Okay. So uh, I thought that maybe that should have also been included. But the chili thing, something, it needs to be sorted out. Yeah, I think that's I think true. That's a couple of comments. I, and you're absolutely right about the connections. For instance, if you go to Hungary, where I was two or three years ago, their cuisine, their civilization almost completely revolves around paprika, which is the most important ingredient. And I wondered, and I did some research into how they got the paprika, and it's actually intriguing because, as you say, certainly in Western India, the Europeans brought the chili, and there's no doubt that we cultivated it ourselves having used these American seeds. But what I didn't know was the Turks came to Western India, bought the chili, bought the seeds, and started a flourishing trade selling Indian chilies to Eastern Europe. So though the Europeans brought the chili to India, the Hungarian paprika is an Indian chili, which the Turks took to them. So there are connections of all kinds that we never even realized. And we are dedicated to this naive assumption that our ancestors never traveled, they never knew the world, that everything was in India, then the Mughals came maybe, Vasco da Gama came maybe, Actually, none of that is true. The world was a much more international place thousands of years ago than we recognize now. Yes, and then there's also the idea of family resemblances that, uh, as Wittgenstein would put it, that, uh, you know, things resemble one another and uh, they are not necessarily because, they resemble one another not necessarily because of, uh, uh, you know, sources and origins and uh, transmission, so that could be also a factor. But because human beings are human beings. So when you have rice and then you boil it and make a patty out of it or make a pancake type of thing out of it, you'll do that of wheat as well, and then you'll try and do it of millets and so forth. So uh, many, you know, things actually resemble uh, one another. Uh, even, in, uh, you know, without having proven connections, because that's the way human society evolves. Uh, anyhow, uh, uh, other questions? Uh, uh, please raise your hand or type it out so that I can read it out. I'm trying to catch them as, as you send them my way. But till they come, I'm also, I mean, I, I, I think that